Okay, so today I'm going to talk about how to make good friends. I'm going to start off with a quote, because the real question here is, why make good friends? Why does that even matter? Right, I know you're here already to make good friends, but why are you doing that in the first place? Here's a quote I want to bring to you guys to make a point here, right? Most people are not introverts. Their friends just suck. Around the right people, they are no longer introverted, right? And the point of that quote is, you are not 100% you unless you are around the right people. Your entire character completely changes depending on who you are around. I'm sure you've noticed this in your life. And to illustrate that point, I've got this picture of me, uh, one of my best mates. His name is Sep, right? This guy, we've been mates for about the best part of a decade. I'd say maybe eight or nine years. And he has been probably the person that's been around the most and the person I can be 100% myself around, right? Shout out to you, Seb, if you're watching. I know you're cringing at this already, but this is something I'm really genuinely appreciative of, right? Friends like this. Is a little picture of us in a park in Glasgow. This is a story of me visiting him in where he lives, his hometown, right, Glasgow, where he's at university right now. He's studying for a degree. And so I went to Scotland to visit him. And that for me was one of the best experiences in my entire life. And one of the best reasons for that was because I was with this person. I was able to be myself and I was able to express who I was fully without having to worry about anything right? I was 100% me. And that's a phrase you're going to hear me say a lot in this video, because it matters a lot, right? We were just like chilling in the park, and I was able to say anything. I could joke, I could make offensive jokes, not worry about who's going to be offended, who's going to be, you know, taking second meanings and taking things deeply and really being hurt by them. I can say whatever I want, right? Think things through and even like, you know, even like slip up in my my language or whatever, and I just be myself completely, right? And that for me is where real happiness comes from, right? I can really genuinely be happy in that kind of environment, and it's it's completely different to how I am like with my friends back home, right? So I was on the train ride home from Scotland, and I realized this, right? I was kind of sat there on the train seat on the way back home, right? And I was like, you know, the way I am with Seb and the way I am with these other friends, right? It's completely different. And these other friends, they're not, they're not like bad people. They're incredible. They're, they're funny. They're charismatic. They're proactive. They like to go out. But it's not quite the same as what I have with Seb, right? I might hold back a joke or two. I might hesitate to say something offensive. I might not necessarily be able to connect with them on a little bit of a deeper level because of the compatibility factor. It doesn't mean they're bad people. They're great people. But it's just, that is what compatibility is. It's like, how well do you get along with someone? Right? And there are factors outside of your control for that. So they're not bad, but it's just different. So it's it's not... 100% me. And I noticed that, right? I noticed, okay, I'm just hanging out at home around my home friends, these other people. And then I go to visit Seb in Scotland and I feel so much happier and so much more. I feel like I get so much more out of interactions on average when I am there visiting Seb, right? Because I can be 100% me. Like if you saw me, if you saw that interaction of me with Seb, I'm a completely different person, right? You would think these two people, right? Me at home versus me with Seb are two completely different people, right? Around Seb, even around strangers, because we were traveling a lot and meeting a lot of strangers, I was plenty extroverted. I talked loads. I wasn't too worried about offending anybody. I talked about deep topics and things like this. I was able to chat for days right? So I talked a lot, right? So big talker, I'll just say that to summarize all those points. But around my friends, I seem a bit more shy. I seem a bit more introverted. I seem a bit more reserved, right? So you might even say, okay, this guy, is he is he shy? Right? Question mark. So 
the difference between these two people, despite the fact that they are the same person, I that's me. I'm still me. But I seem like a shy... Like I, you would see these two people. You would see me in these two different scenarios and think, they must be two different people. That's so bizarre. And why is that? It's because of the friends that we surround ourselves with. Right? So around one set of friends, I am a big talker. And one around another set of friends, I seem a bit more shy. Right? So this is why this topic is a life-changing thing, right? You have to get this right, and this is why it matters so much, because it's life-changing. It matters to change who you are able to be, right? That, that's the big thing, right? The life-changing thing is it changes who you are, who you are. Right? You've heard of that quote. You've heard of the thing that says you are the average of the five people you hang around the most. That's very true. Right? You are influenced a lot by the five people you hang around the most. Right? I might not say that you're the average of them, but who you are is influenced by those five people. Right? And it's not limited to five, it's not limited to even ten or twenty, or even like two or one. It's just a number that people you kind of like randomly arbitrarily stop at five right but it's important the people you hang around with define who you will become right so with that being said let's get into the meat of this question and that is how do you do it so you're looking at me and you're thinking okay i came to this video to, th to answer the question what do i do okay what do i do Right, I want to get more friends. What do I do? There's no big secret here. It is going to be talking to new people. Right? That's always been the case. Talk to new people. But how do you do that? Talk to new people. Three basic steps here, right? Three principles. Very simple. I'll tell you straight away. I'm not going to waste your time here. The first is this. So it goes like this, meet, meet, if I can spell today, meet, talk, invite. Okay, it's as simple as that. M-T-I, if you want to remember it as an acronym. Like M-I-T, but M-T-I. Okay, meet, talk, invite. And here's the thing, when you've done this, Right When you meet a new person, when you start a conversation, and when you invite someone, that is when a friendship is achieved. right? Because you've taken the friendship, you've taken this conversation, and you've given it another reason to be there. right? So you talk in the first place, that isn't necessarily a friendship, because you happen to bump into each other, you happen to be at the gym together, or you happen to be at the you know, chess club together, whatever, right? If you invite them somewhere else, that means that you have given a reason for you to be together at a certain place without any kind of ulterior motive, without any kind of coincidence happening there. You're just there to see each other for that reason alone. And that's where a friendship starts. That's where you become friends. That's the definition of friends to me because I had to define what friendship meant to me when I talked about this kind of stuff to other people. When I said, okay, here's how you make friends. I had to define that. And that is my definition. When you invite someone somewhere and they agree to meet up and you meet up successfully, then you've become friends because the reason you're meeting up is because you want to see them. And that's the definition of friendship, right? When you see someone without having to kind of have an excuse to meet them, without having to kind of have a, you know, another thing there like oh we're at the gym i happen to see you that doesn't mean we're friends if i say meet me at the pub later tonight at 5 p.m then we're friends right because we're just there to see each other i wouldn't be at the pub on my own right? i wouldn't be at the bowling alley on my own i wouldn't be at the whatever right social places where people meet up to see each other right not for anything else. So that's the definition of friendship, first of all. So let me break this down, okay? 
Meeting people, first of all. Number one, meeting people. Meeting people. So don't make this harder than it needs to be, okay? Go to your old places, the places that you are used to going to, right? Old places. So if you already go to a chess club, if you already go to the gym, if you already go to the sauna, go to those places, right? Because you've established the fact that you like going to those places and it's already a thing that you do, right? And so you can meet new people there, right? So these people will have something in common with you, something to kind of chat about and to do while you're there, okay? So go to those old places and go to new places as well, right? But don't necessarily make it so that it's like a, a massive deal, right? I know a lot of you are thinking that you need to like go to a crowded marketplace and just talk to everyone there because it's the most social thing to do. And that's what the people do in the movies and the books and, you know, TV shows. It doesn't need to be like that. Pick something just like you picked your old places, right? Something that you like and something that you will go to a lot, right? Because if you don't like it, if you don't want to go to it, then you won't have anything in common with the people there. Or it will be incredibly unlikely that you'll have something in common with the people there. Right? If you go to a place you like, if you go to a place that you want to go to and you're likely to go to again, so like maybe a basketball league or something like that, and you love basketball, you love talking about it, you love watching it, you love playing it, you're likely to come across people that have and share that same interest if you go to a basketball league, right? And you play basketball with them, right? It's so much easier, so much more facilitated when you do that kind of thing, right? So this example could be anything, right? The gym, the sauna, chess, basketball, football, hockey, rugby. Sports are a very common one. A run club is great as well. A run club you can really get into and really... That's almost anyone. Almost anyone is into running. So you can meet anyone there. Right? And the more specific you go down, maybe you're in some kind of Warhammer thing. Right? I don't know how niche that is, but it sounds niche to me. And so if you like that and someone else likes that, then you're bound to get along a lot because not many people are into that, I think. Right? I'm not sure. I'm not really, you know, updated upon these things. So... Once you've kind of gone through this, you should end up with some kind of list. Old places, new places, some ideas of things to go to. A list of places that you want to go to and talk to those people that are there or at least interact with them in the first place, right? We're at step one, just meeting people. So we haven't even gotten to the talking stage yet, right? Have a list of places that you have ideas, right? A, B, C, and go to those places and meet those people. Right, The first kind of thing you do before even talking to people is like maintain some kind of eye contact. That's like the basic kind of thing, right? Eye contact. Because you can absolutely, you can absolutely go to these places and have a standoffish attitude, right? You can be like, you know, kind of hoodie up and kind of looking down at the ground, arms folded and kind of like, you know, not looking at anyone, right? Whereas if you're like this, if you have an open body language and you're smiling and you make eye contact. So let's say I was in a room, a party or something like that, and I looked into your eyes and I, I kind of smiled, right? And maybe I waved a bit, right? You would think, oh, what a friendly guy. Like, I, I want to, you know, I'm open to talking to him. Versus the guy who is like hoodie up, looking at the ground, arms folded, maybe in the corner of the room, and they're not looking at anything in particular, right? They're just kind of looking at the ground. Like, do do you feel like you have an easy time connecting with that guy or the previous guy obviously the previous guy right so what did i do eye contact smile even wave like a head nod or something like that you might go like that or like that depending on what the culture is and where you live like typically uh if i know someone if i'm walking past someone i go like that it depends where you live right so that is an attitude you can bring when you meet people in these places, right? So, obviously at some point you need to start talking. So let's talk about that. Part number two. 
talking. Cool, fantastic. What do I say? This is probably the most popular question I get asked when people ask me for advice on this kind of topic. What do I say? Whether it's making new friends or talking to girls, things like this, they ask me, okay, what do I say, Dylan? Because I don't know what to say. I walk up to the girl and I just, I get, I, my mind goes blank and I'm nervous and I don't know what to do or say, right? What do I do, right? This is a good question, right? Because you can say anything and a lot of the stuff you'll say won't work and a lot of the stuff you will say will work, right? But maybe there's no specific answer that I can give you that will work every time. Apart from this, this is something you can say every single time and it will work. And that is, hello, right? You can say hello and that will work every time. Not many people will be angry or annoyed or offended at you saying hello to them, right? If they are, then they're probably not a normal individual and you should probably run away, right? Because <laughs> if they aren't polite enough to respond to a hello, then they're probably not worth your time, right? So the basics, right? Hello, nice to meet you, etc. That kind of thing. Just a basic kind of conversation. The stuff that you're taught typically when you are a toddler to meet new people. Hello, how are you? Nice to meet you. That kind of stuff. Very easy stuff to say in a starter for a conversation that you might be nervous for, right? And I want to quickly address the, the subtopic of social anxiety. Right? I could make an entire video about this so I can, you know, really go in depth here, but let's just really quickly kind of address this point here before I move forward, right? With social anxiety, if you're afraid to talk to people in the first place, right? So let me just write this down. Social anxiety. What you want to do here? Anxiety. What you want to do with this is basically address the proof versus promises aspect that exists inside your brain, right? Because your brain right now, if you have an amount of social anxiety, it's convinced that something is going to go wrong if I ever talk to anybody, or if I ever talk to a stranger. Something's going to go wrong. It's all going to go to hell in a handbasket. The world's going to end if I ever talk to someone, right? I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get the idea, right? And the thing is, what your brain needs is not a promise. You can't just tell yourself, it'll be okay. It's fine. Your brain's paranoid. It's not going to listen to reason. But it will listen to proof. right? If you can prove to your brain that it is okay, that the world isn't going to end, then it will be convinced. right? So when negotiating with this kind of social anxiety beast in your brain then you can go one way which is promises which i'm telling you won't work because your brain is petrified it's scared right but what will work is proof and what does that entail that entails you trying in the first place trying with something very small right? So pick something simple. Say hello to a stranger that you're not too intimidated by. So let's say there's just some guy walking down the street and you can just say hello to him and nothing else. Hello as you walk past and that's it. Maybe he might say hello back, whatever. Just say hello. And what you will find is nothing went wrong. Everything was fine. I'm okay. I'm still here. I'm, I'm alive. And that's the reassurance that your brain needs. And so slowly over time, you're going to upgrade that. That hello is going to upgrade into a hello, how are you? Hello, nice to meet you. Hello, isn't the weather great today? Hello, I like your dog. Hello, I like your hat. Right? And as you keep climbing this, and it's a slow process, but over time, 
you will gain that confidence and annihilate your social anxiety. Right, this is kind of the graph I might draw to prove or to kind of show that point of social anxiety being uh, grown out of over time. Right, so that's my little kind of uh, nod to social anxiety as a thing that you can deal with in life. Right, so after that, so we talked about the basics. Let me write this down. Basics such as hello, how are you? We'll write down hello for now, right? And that is perfectly acceptable as a greeting. Hello. It works every time. Trust me, right? Unless they're crazy, right? Which is like 1% of the time, okay? Another topic I'd like to talk about is location defaults. So I was helping someone out the other day and we talked about how he can talk in the gym and things like this, right? So there are location defaults with the gym, right? What do I mean by location defaults? Location defaults are a phrase or a set of phrases that you can say in a given environment that makes sense anytime you say them, right? So let's pick the gym, for example. What can you say in the gym that just always makes sense? Whatever you're talking about. How about this? What are you working on today? Right? That is a question that always makes sense because people in the gym are always working on something. Oh, I'm working on chest today. Right? I'm working on legs today. I'm working on back today. I'm working on my arms today. Right? This is a question that always works. Right? So it's a location default. It's something that you learn over time. Okay, I can say this to anybody and it still works. It's not awkward. It's not too personal. It's not too offensive. It's not too whatever you're afraid of. You know this always works. Right? Another example I talk about a lot is the sauna. Right? Because I go to the sauna a lot. And a phrase you can say in there is, how long do you normally spend in here? Right? Because... In the sauna, it's about time. There's a timer on the wall, and it's about how long you spend in there. So, okay, I spend five minutes in there. I usually spend 15 minutes in there. I spend 10 minutes in there. I actually do two rounds of 10 minutes, right? And it naturally starts a conversation flowing, and these are super useful, right? These location defaults. The sauna, the gym, the chess club, right? You can say, oh, what's your favorite opener? Because like an opener is like your first move in chess. And that that's something that, you know, chess heads talk about. Chess heads normally have a favorite opener. I'm guessing so. I'm not really into chess that much. But I'm guessing that's a default thing, right? A location default. And what you'll find is that these location defaults allow for the beginning of a flow of conversation, right? So you might move from, you know, step one, basics. Step two, location defaults, right? These don't necessarily have to go in a certain order, but they are a development in, in terms of the, the structure or complexity of what you are doing when you're talking. The complexity of conversation, we can call it that, right, to break it down. So basics and then location defaults is what I might talk about when I'm helping someone out in the, the realm of social skills, okay? So number three, here is genuine curiosity genuine curiosity so this is when you don't necessarily have a script of things you're saying anymore right so before it might have been you know you kind of like remembering in your head it's like it's partially memory but it's not really you're not being fake by saying hello because it is a default thing to say, right? So these above things. Hello, the location default of what are you working on, etc. that kind of thing. You might have memorized that. You might have kind of had it in your head ready to go. But beyond this, it's like, oh, no man's land. You're out in the ocean now. You're in charge of this boat and where to sail it. What do you do? 
you follow your own genuine curiosity, right? So you ask questions that you actually want to know the answer to, right? So typical scenarios that this comes up in, right? Maybe someone's talking about their dog and I'm like, oh, what breed is your dog, right? I might genuinely want to know that. It seems like a very simple thing, but I want to know that. What breed is your dog, right? Or maybe, okay, this is something I see a lot of people miss a lot, right? A lot of people, when they ask about, okay, what do you do for a living? And they respond with a job title, right? And I don't know what that is. It's something very complicated sounding. It's like, okay, I work in financial derivative banking marketing, right? I'm like, what is that? I'm thinking in my mind, right? But I have seen so many people in my life, and this is frustrating because it just skips past some an opportunity of conversation that you're just missing, right? And that is when someone says something complicated. I I do financial deri- derivatives, right? And someone just pretends to know, like, oh, okay, financial derivatives. Okay, cool. And they just pretend to know what that is. And it, it just stops the conversation short because now they don't even know what to ask. They don't even know what to continue the conversation with because they don't know what it is. But for you guys, but for us in our lives, we have to be willing to admit when we don't know something. Okay? What is that? I don't, I've never heard of a financial derivatives manager. What What does that even entail? What do you do in your job? Right? The ability to say, I don't know, is a powerful conversation technique. Right? I don't know what that is. Please tell me more. Because guess what people's favorite topic to talk about is? Themselves. Right? Tell me more about yourself. Right? And they will happily talk about themselves. Right? Let me t- let, let me pick a topic that you might be interested in. Right? So if you're interested in, for example, the topic of self-improvement. I'm sure if I asked you about that, you can talk for days about it. Right? If you're interested in basketball, if you're interested in in lamps, in paper, whatever it is, if I asked you about what you're interested in, you can talk about it for days. And if it's someone's job title, they're probably interested in it, or at least they know a lot about it, right? And so asking that question is a great way to do that. And the point of this section is to genuinely follow your curiosity. If you don't know something, ask that question. If you want to know, ask that question. I want to know what this guy's dog, what this guy's dog, what its breed is. Right? I want to know what that job title means. I don't know what that is, and I want to know. I don't like not knowing stuff, right? And strangely enough, when you say, when you say I don't know, it garners more respect. It gets you more respect than saying or pretending that you do know when you don't, right? It's this element of telling the truth, which which was what I talked about in a couple of videos back, right? There's more respect in being honest and authentic than there is in pretending that you know something, even if you never get found out, right? So follow your genuine curiosity because it allows for that conversation to flow even further than the first two points I talked about. The basics, hello, how are you? The location defaults. Right? This is you charting your own territory, and so there's some skill involved here. There's some skill involved here, and so you can really get good at this part especially. What's next here? So the next topics are not necessarily, you know, an increase in complexity, but another tip that you can kind of have a mindset about, another framework, right? One framework is the genuine curiosity, another framework is this one, and it's called medium talk. Different people call it different things. I like to call it medium talk. Medium talk, if I can spell it correctly. So what this is, is I'm sure you've heard of small talk. Talking about the weather, talking about like things that don't really matter to anyone, but kind of are relevant in the small, in the small kind of ways. Then there's big talk where you talk about big ideas and when you talk about life and the meaning of everything and you talk about, okay, how's your relationship with your father like? How is your life going? Do you enjoy your job? Is it 
satisfying? Are you happy in life? Bit too deep on a first conversation, bit too personal on a first conversation. But there's a, a development you can make here, right? When you have done your basic introduction, hello, how are you? My name is Dylan. How's your day been? Things like this. And you can ask about, you know, maybe job titles, things like that. And it flows. So if I can change my pen to red. From there, from small talk to a section here that I like to call medium talk, right? Don't skip ahead to big talk, okay? If you skip, big mistake, okay? It's too deep. People get freaked out. They're like, oh, why are you asking me about my life and my big, deep questions? Go to here. Medium talk. These are questions like, how has your day been? Right? That can go anywhere, right? They can say, oh, I, I was at work or it's a weekend. I played golf. I read some books. I did this and it was good, right? Not only are you asking them what they did, but you ask them how they felt about it. And that isn't a surface level question, right? I did A, I did B, I did C. And how did you feel about it? I felt happy about this. I felt sad about that. I was angry about this, right? Whatever it is, the details are up to them, but they can answer in a myriad of different ways with this medium talk thing, right? So a medium talk question might be something like, how has your day been, right? And from that, you can combine a different these different techniques, you can follow your genuine curiosity about one of these answers. I played golf today and I was annoyed because it was raining, right? And so I could say in response to that, oh, so does rain ruin golf? I've never played golf before. I don't really know much about it. Tell me, what does rain do to golf? Does it make it bad to play golf? Right? That might seem like a, a stupid question, right? But if it... <laughs> It facilitates the flow of the conversation, right? It allows it so that he can talk more about golf and I've given him a pathway to do that, right? Sometimes conversation isn't about sounding clever, about sounding smart, about sounding like, oh, I know my stuff. It's about talking, it's about exploring ideas. It's not, the purpose isn't to win, right? It's to have the conversation flow. That's what matters more. And that's what a lot of people mistake, make the mistake of doing. Like a lot of people that I help out, they make this mistake and they come back to me and they say, oh, some, for some reason, my conversations aren't working. Well, it's because of this. You're trying to win. It's not winning. That's the point of the game. It's playing the game in the first place. Right? So that's medium talk. Another topic or another kind of thing I want to talk about is this thing called inverse charisma this is really cool i learned about this fairly recently actually because i was listening to a chris williamson podcast again uh and he talks about this concept inverse charisma i think he was interviewing gawinda bogle so i'm not sure who to credit for that either gawinda bogle or chris williamson i'm not sure please correct me in the comments below if you know who this is but this concept is essentially when you make the other person feel charismatic, right? So there's you, you can feel charismatic, or you can make the other person feel charismatic. And how do you do that? How do you make someone else feel charismatic, right? Here's the charisma coming out of them, right? By doing and asking these questions, right? Being a good listener, right? Being a good listening ear. Right, so listen very well and respond in a way that makes them feel like you know they're they are exciting to listen to. Oh wow, you did what on holiday? That's amazing. You, oh, I love your stories, man, they're incredible. I love the way that you speak to people. You know, I really like your energy, man, you're really cool, right. I like hanging out with you. How do those things make you feel? What I just said. If I said that to you in person, how would that make you feel? 
better about yourself, right? And so try to channel that kind of energy when you talk to other people. And that's called inverse charisma. Listen really well, right? So like really like make eye contact. Don't be on your phone. Don't read a book or anything. Just focus in, you know, kind of really like pay attention and like, you know, nod every now and then then ask the right questions, be really interested and compliment them and really make them feel like they are the shit, right? At the end of the conversation, they were like, oh, I'm a pretty good conversationalist, Emma, you know? It's just, it's something that you can really instill in that person and that makes you a fun person to talk to, right? If they feel good, Right? If they feel good at the end of their interaction with you, then you become this fun person to talk to. Right, And that's how it really, really multiplies in terms of your ability to make friends. Because you're now that guy that everyone wants to talk to. Right, Small concept called inverse charisma. It matters a lot. So, okay. And that's everything I have to say about talking, right? The final bit, the third bit, invite. Number three, invite. So as I said before, this is the act that makes the friendship. Because before this, you're just meeting in a certain place and it's just a coincidence that you're meeting. If you invite them to something else and they turn up, you're meeting because you like each other, because you're friends, because you're interested in hanging out with each other, right? That's what a friendship is defined by. So a bunch of different ideas here. You can go to the pub, you can go for a walk, you can go to play mini golf or uh, what's it called? Top golf, things like this. Bowling, ice skating, if my pen can work, bowling ice skating, just sitting in the park, going on holiday, whatever, right? It doesn't really matter as long as you're hanging out for some reason, right? A big one that I did at university was a board game thing, right? So I made a group chat and group chats are a very good way of kind of leading this kind of thing, by the way, group chats. Because look, inviting someone to do something one-on-one for the first time it's a bit intimidating, right? It's kind of like they feel, you know, super... Like they have to turn up, otherwise you they let you down or whatever, right? Or they like they feel like, okay, what if I don't like this guy? What if something happens? What if whatever? Like it's so much easier in a group, right? I'll just tell you that, right? It makes it less pressure and group chats are super useful for that. So in university... I was like the guy known for creating group chats, right? I created group chats everywhere and I had different friends and different groups of friends for different things. And one of them was for board games, right? We had a a group chat called BG, board games, right? And I put in there every friend I'd made over the course of about six months, right? There was a particular uh, thing that happened in my life and I kind of lost a lot of friends and I had to just make some new ones, right? And so I went out with social and made a bunch of new friends, right? And so this was a great way to organize group meetups, right? And to have friends hang out with me, for them to bring in other friends to my place and do that kind of thing. And so hosting is a good way of doing that, right? You're kind of taking the pressure off of that person for putting in the effort of like, you know, hosting themselves or getting ready to go outside to a restaurant or a pub or whatever, you're hosting, right? So you, by being the inviter, right? You're putting in most of the efforts, right? So be polite in that way. So in being polite, you put in most of the effort. Effort. Okay, so you have to kind of assume the burden and put in more of the effort because it's it's just polite to do so, right? You'd rather put in too much effort than put in too little effort, 
is my point here, right? Really try and go out of your way to make this a pleasant experience for them so that at least they want to hang out with you again, right? Because if you put in way too little effort and say, oh, yeah, meet me at the street corner and, you know, be super vague about the time and like not even show up in time and things like this, like put some effort in, right? Tell them the time and the place and be there a little bit early so that they can, you know, they shouldn't be on their own or whatever and make it so that they're comfortable. Buy snacks, buy drinks and things like that to kind of, you know, have and entertain your guests, be hospitable, things like this, right? Clean your place up a bit, right? Make it look nice, right? Just little things like that. Make it a little bit better for this to go on. So... Yeah, that's all I have to say, really. And the whole point of this is to be the initiator as well, right? Well, sorry, a point I want to make is that you have to be the initiator in all this, right? Initiator. My pen's stuttering a little bit. In all of these, you have to be the initiator, right? In all three steps... When you're meeting someone, you have to be the one that goes out there to meet them. When you are talking to someone, you have to be the one that goes out there and starts a conversation and puts in a lot of the effort in the conversation. You have to think about these things. Okay, hello, how are you? Okay, location defaults. Okay, uh, medium talk. Okay, let's see, uh, inverse charisma, right? All these things you kind of think about a little bit more than that person might be, the person you're trying to make friends with, right? Right? And in inviting people, you have to put a little bit more effort because, look, you want this, right? You want this to take place. You want this to happen. You have to be the initiator, right? And the thing is, that's not a bad thing, right? You get respect for it, in fact, right? If you are the initiator, you're like respected as the person who brings together the people in the group. And so I received that kind of respect when I was at university as the person that brought together people in the group, right? Joe, meet Anna, right? I brought these two people together and they, now they know each other because of me, right? It's kind of like that. So this was my uni experience and it was lovely, right? And still, I had very few of those people become those golden friends that I talked about at the start. The friends that could be 100% me around, right? Very few of those people were like that to me. It just goes to show you the numbers game, right? You make a, a huge bunch of friends, right? You might make tons and tons and tons of friends and only a small fraction of those people will become those friends that you can be 100% you around. That's just a fact. That's the probability. That's just the, the maths that you play with there, right? It doesn't mean that it's not worth playing. It's a game not worth playing, right? It is absolutely worth playing because even within this category of people that like might not let you be 100% you, there are plenty of funny people, good people, right? Just wonderful characters, just like, you know, People that you would regret not meeting, right? They might not be perfect, but they're just wonderful, right? That's, that's the only way I can describe it, really. Wonderful characters. Wonderful. So, with that being said, I've talked about a lot and my throat's kind of dry and I want to conclude this anyway, right? So to conclude, conclusion. Better friends means a better you, right? And how do you get better friends? You need to make more friends in the first place. And how do you make more friends in the first place? With those three parts in that framework that I told you about. Meet people talk to people, invite people. How do you meet people? Go to those places where you have people that you are, you have a lot in common with, talking to people, using a little bit of technique, mostly the basics, hello, how are you? And a few little things that you can think about while you're having a conversation to 
give you the mindset to be able to chart your own path and sail your own boat in the conversation that you're having. And finally, to invite people, be polite, put the effort in and be the initiator and you can't go wrong. So it is that simple and it is genuinely just that, right? So to end this video, I want to say, I promise you, you will gain friends and friends that you love from doing these things that I've mentioned in this video, right? If you implement these things and really genuinely put in the effort, you will gain friends. And that's what I hope for you. Genuinely, I feel happy to leave that with you at the end of this video, right? So thanks for watching. Take care of yourself. Until next time, bye-bye. Knowledge is power and the power is yours.